Hey, good morning again, fellow flat building travelers and coffee chat friends. Another update here on our last meeting, which took place a few days ago, coffee chat, and our topic for the evening was conscience. It was an interesting little discussion with a smaller group, which often is beneficial actually because there is a greater opportunity for participation than if there's a larger group and people don't feel so left out perhaps. It was quite a number of new people, which is also good because it injects some new ideas into the conversation. We started out with uh, a few comments that people had on what conscience is and well actually I'll, I'll read my little comments afterwards but some of these points that I'll point out here were comments as a result of little presentation one guy was talking about how the sociopathic or the psychopathic and or the psychopathic personality what was talked about here may not apply because well, I forget exactly why but I think there was a comment made afterwards that you know the, the the idea with coffee chat is all the topics we cover here are predicated upon the idea the overall umbrella idea of improving the quality of our lives and if somebody was displaying psychopathic or sociopathic tendencies this may not this may not have entered awareness the idea that what I'm doing is helping to improve the quality of my life my life so I think that and then the concept was made that there's probably no psychopaths or sociopaths in the room which probably was certainly accurate because anybody who comes to coffee chat is putting themselves out there as as though my hand up is I'm somebody who wants to improve the quality of my life and listen and share and put, have input on a discussion in that direction, right? There was also the, the, the mention of babies and how babies somehow, even at a very young age, can have something within them that sort of indicates that they have an early form of conscience which was really interesting, which actually somebody mentioned later the idea of the subconscious subconscious mind and the conscious mind. The subconscious mind we could probably say is what is part and parcel of what governs all those auto aspects of ourselves like in the physical body, the heart beating and all that sort of thing. There must be some sort of a, a signal going through there. Well obviously babies are born with all that so there's other you know, messages that a baby is born with integral to that individual and therefore therefore there could be what resembles conscience coming through in terms of what is beneficial for that individual even though very young and very small there was also at some point the brought up the distinction or the possible distinction between intuition and conscience and that what some people were talking about in reference to conscience might more accurately be described as intuition so bear that in mind when you when you listen to to what I have to present here because it might come across as intuition my impression on this was that intuition is some sort of a, a feeling that we have within which can then direct us on the level of our conscience. So they're, they're tied together and in many cases, yeah, in many cases what I may say or what other people may say, they might be interchangeable for sure. There's no question about that, I would say. So I'll go right into what I shared and maybe you have some ideas you want to feed back in some way. I'll pretty much read it here because I didn't uh, commit this to any memory. I wrote this up just the day before the presentation. So the idea was conscience. And when I when I did the uh, introduction to it, I wrote it on the whiteboard, C-O-N dash science. So it looked like con science. That was just sort of to 
to get people maybe thinking as in terms of where this word came from. So just just bear that in mind when we start out here. So basically, we've heard it many times, all of us, I'm sure, that statements like "listen to your conscience," "act upon your conscience." Well, what is this really, and why is it important in terms of our quality of life experience? Because that's the, like I said earlier, the overriding umbrella of what we're talking about here. Now, you may be well aware, if you've listened to a few of these little presentations before, that very often I like to look at the word, the words that are being said in terms of the topic, to get an idea of where they're coming from. This may or may not be valuable. Sometimes it is, sometimes not really, because what we put our meaning on, how we put, how we see the meaning of a word is very often more important. But it's sometimes helpful because it gets us an idea of what people who have come before us were actually thinking in terms of the word, and therefore it can give us an idea of what other people might mean as well. So the word, the reason I wrote it con-science is to, is to break it down. Because there's basically two words in there. With the suffix con, if you look it up in its origin and so on, it means being privy to or sharing in. And if you know something about Latin languages, I know a little bit about Spanish, having known my wife being of us Spanish speaking and so on. The word C O N con means with. Like you've all probably heard of chili con carne. This means chili, which is usually the chili bean, or not the chili bean, but the uh, the chili pepper, or chili beans probably, <laughs> too. Con, which means with, and carne is meat. So a chili con carne is a chili beans with chili with meat. Usually they put some hamburger or something in there, and that's the base stock of chili con carne. And then, when you put it together with science, that would mean that whatever, whatever we are, we're privy to, or sharing in, or with science. So the next question is, what is science? Well, we, we normally know, we think of science in terms of biology and chemistry and whatnot. But if you look at the word deep enough, it refers to the word to know, or know something. Which comes, which and no comes from the Latin root no seer, and we will recognize that from the word gnostic, or more commonly agnostic, and of course that means agnostic, and ag, somebody who's an agnostic is saying I don't know, because a uh, as a, as a, as a suffix means or a prefix. Sorry, I used, might have used the word suffix before. Yeah, prefix. I use that word suffix for con as well. Prefix, something that comes at the beginning. Is an agnostic is somebody who is without knowing. They're saying, I don't know. So gnostic then is is the root of knowing, or is, is related to knowing in the origin. Also, what can be related there when you look it up in the in the origin of these words is the word can or the word ken. And if you can imagine, can is means the ability. So if you have knowledge of the ability, right? The word can I never heard about, but K-E-N, I thought it was a guy's name, but it is actually a word also. And it comes from the, the words sight or knowledge. Something you see is real. Like I don't have to wonder whether this table, let's say I put my hand in front on uh, right in front of me here, I don't have to worry about whether it's here. I have the knowledge that it's here because it's, it's very um, relevant to me right now, right? The camera is sitting on it, for example. So what does this make, how does this make sense to, to what we're talking about here? Well, we'd say that when we're in tune with our conscience, that we are in knowing or feeling or the sight of what it is that we're perceiving. And therefore it is a very reliable sense. 
Use a very simple example. If you and I are talking in the same room, this is in terms of knowledge, right? We don't have to have faith or belief that we're talking to each other and that we're in each other's presence for the simple reason that we have the knowledge or the sight or the hearing or the emotional sense of one another. There is the solidity of the science of the experience, right? And the same thing goes for the intangibles. It's just not quite as definite for us. We can get the sense of what is truthful for us through our conscience. Through conscience, we don't need to be told that it is wrong to kill our neighbor. We know this already. It's like you and I are talking. Somebody doesn't have to tell me that you are in front of me or tell you that I'm in front of you. You know that. That's, that's, the, that's a conscience. You're with that knowing, right? Now, some of you, if you've gone to the Coffee Chat website, would have recognized that or noticed that I put a Martin Luther King video there. And it was about, it was called an If Faith Sermon or something like that. But you'll see it on the website if you go there. Coffeechat.webs.com, that is. I recently posted a video there in that video section. And you may notice how he talks about if and though as a primer to what he talked about in his reference to conscience. He was using a lot of the word, a lot of times the word faith, because he was. it's a bit, a bit of a religious sermon. But he, it's interesting to notice where he brings up the word conscience. Even though there was religious overtones. In terms of conscience being unconditional. And that when we live by conscience, indeed, we live in a way as though the old religious people would have said, though heavens may fall, so help me God. So it wasn't an unconditional thing. It wasn't like where he talked about the if. If I'm not harmed or whatever, I'll do this. If somebody doesn't tease me, I'll do this and so on. He was talking about though the heavens may fall, though I may have challenges, I'm going to go forward anyways. And this is what the conscience calls it. Conscience is unconditional. It doesn't say if things work out, you're going to feel this way. You're going to feel it anyway. And that's why we talk about sometimes about how if we do something that's contrary to our conscience, we end up living with that heavy heart kind of thing, because conscience kind of feels like it comes from the heart. You know? Another one I like to, I know that when I said this, there was kind of a withdrawal of shock almost that I said it in my little presentation here. There's, there's a, a state in the United States of America called New Hampshire, and on their license plate, <laughs> it's quite a harsh statement actually, it says, live free or die and this is kind of a this is this is a though statement isn't it it's not an if statement an if statement would be i'll live free as long as you know i don't get myself in trouble this is i'm gonna live free or or live free or die it's though i may die and this is the the statements that are behind matrimonial vows very often too right for better or for worse, it's all these sort of things that are built up. I'm going to love you forever. This is a a connection, and this is a this. And not saying this is necessarily something directly to do with conscience. What I'm saying is, I'm ho hoping to set the stage that conscience is something which is unconditional. And I'm just using some examples of unconditionality in terms of what we say. Very often we don't follow through with it, but this is kind of the nature of conscience. We feel it no matter whether we do the right thing for us or what is perceived to be detrimental to us, sort of thing. From what I can see, therefore, conscience is though are kind of like our inner truth. 
from that perspective, we either live from truth or in varying degrees of lies. And when we make the break, finally, consciously, right, there's that word again, to finally, to, to, to finally live by our truth, it is not necessarily an easy road. Actually, it's a road fraught with many challenges. But as a result of us, as the result, therefore, is that we're better able to make rational sense of our paths as being more congruent with our overall purpose in life. And the more we continue to live from our conscience first, the clearer the conscience becomes in terms of our ability to perceive it. Liken this to a decision to clean up the desktop on our computers, as I have to do. We can notice how everything seems to work better. Everything's more accessible. The computer runs more smoothly. And for our lives, when we live a life of lies, it's like a computer that's really messed up. The messages to our conscience become very clouded. And we build up a matrix of lies upon lives. And yes, life can seem a little bit easier to live a lie, but yet it seems more out of control. There seems to be more forces that direct our lives in this way. On the other hand, when we decide to ignore the lies of the ego, that the ego has bought into, and we begin to live a life of messages from deep within our conscience, we eventually get accustomed to seeing or sensing or perceiving the conscience more easily. And with this, we get a sense of a greater purpose in life, which begins to take shape for us in, in terms of a greater sense of clarity. The result is that we can see examples in humanity, within ourselves indeed, but people like Martin Luther King, who, as time went by, became absolutely fearless in the face of what he had to deal with. Yes, indeed, in, in spite of what he had to deal with, he seemed to have this peaceful, yet strong presence about him. And we can all have this presence about ourselves as well. When we live according to our conscience, we no longer have to live by codes of what is right and what is wrong, which may be completely alien to us because they're not coming from our conscience. They're not what necessarily our conscience indicates. Rather, when we live from the constitution of what we really are, which the conscience is a part of, the source of all knowing for what is best for us in every moment, you might say, all we have to do then is check in to ourselves, a greater sense of self, capital O, ourselves, on a more regular basis, to see where the next physical or the next mental step may be. We never need any more direction than this. And this may seem to others around us as objectionable at times. It may, be, it may appear that we become conscientious objectors, for sure. However, are we really objecting or are we moving in a direction of conscience? See, we can choose to see ourselves as conscientious contributors or participants rather than objectors. You see, the comes back to the, the cup half full, half empty way of looking things, right? As I see it then, so often in life, we humans have lived 
the dictates of what's downstream of us. Rather than, and what I mean by that is, what's created by us, the codes and so on of our, ourselves individually, our man-made religions or politics or codes and all these sorts of things. We've, we've been living by the dictates of these because we weren't in tune with our conscience. And we have ignored the conscience many times. And therefore, to some extent, have lived an easier life, maybe. Because it's easier if we don't have to check into ourselves sometimes and just check into what we're supposed to be doing, in quotation marks, based on the civil expectations or the dictates of, of whoever, right? Sometimes that's easier. But it's an unfulfilling life. And it's the life of enslavement to powers we feel we have no control over. Yet all the while, we have this opportunity to live according to our conscience, free of the gyrations put forth by our own lies. A more challenging life, perhaps, yes, but a more healthy, peaceful, and I mean an inner peaceful and purposeful one. The choice is obvious, wouldn't you say? Thank you for listening, and I hope you join me again at some point. I usually put these up every couple of weeks. Have a wonderful week, and I hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.